Hey everybody, welcome to Bod's Mayhem Hour. I am your host, John DeBod, a.k.a. The Bod Father. And as always, I'm bringing you guys awesome, awesome interviews. And today I have an awesome guest on the line, I should say. He is from the band Crash Midnight Lead Vocals, Sean Soho. Sean, how's it going? Not too bad, John. How you doing? Uh, you know, at the hustle and bustle and, and try to get everything done before uh, Thanksgiving and things like that. And uh, let's talk about some Crash Midnight. What's going on with you guys? How's it going? Well, we just released our album on Tuesday. It's um, It's been a whirlwind. This is our debut. It's out on Universal right now. And we uh, we actually sold out of all of the um, all the copies in our hometown, Newbury Comics. That's awesome. That was pretty cool here in Boston. Yeah, that that you know, and that says a lot when your hometown does that, you know, because you got a lot of backing support, and like you said, the debut album, uh, "Lost in the City," that that's really good, and uh, I'm I'm proud of you guys for doing that. And uh, what are some of your favorite tracks off this album? Well, you know, all these tracks really are, are very personal to us. They were all written while we were living in this little two bedroom apartment. It was five, sometimes six guys living in there, and just all the the struggles that you kind of have as you're you know cutting your teeth as a new band and trying to break into a Boston music scene that wasn't um, really tailored for a band like us. It was back in the new metal days, you know, going on in the city, and, uh, and then it's it's a big college city, so you have a lot of those like Weekend Warrior, Dave Matthews Band knockoff kids coming out of their dorm and trying to set up a show and stuff. So it was really uh. It was, a, it was a struggle for us. I think we, we faced a lot of opposition coming in and being a rock and roll band in a city where there just wasn't that element anymore. And that's basically all the tracks on this album are, you know, based off of that. Everything from Diamond Boulevard, which is, is one of my favorites, especially live, because I love playing that riff and running around like crazy men on stage for that. <laughs> that's railing against, you know, everybody that was trying to take advantage of us. And, uh, yeah. you know, and just the, the promoters that, you know, were struggling to to not get taken advantage of and lose all our money to every night. So how much growth, Sean, have you seen this band uh, go through since the beginning, you know, and plus EPs that you guys have put out probably and stuff like growing from song to song? How, how, how much does that happen? You know, that's that's a really interesting question. I actually haven't gotten that one yet. It's, um, you know, a lot of these tracks are older tracks, uh, mm-hmm. stuff like 151. And that was, you know, a, a joke that kind of came about before we even had more than two people in this band. And it was something that we played at parties. It was, I mean, it all started off where we were, you know, piss ass drunk on a, uh, you know, the, <laughs> on a night and we heard night train come on and we were drinking 151 and we started writing alternate lyrics to it. And, uh, and then it just kind of became a funny thing to play at parties, and then all of a sudden it worked its way into our shows, and then we're like, ah, maybe we should uh, put some attention to this and make it a real song. But I think, you know, that was off our very first EP uh, called Fresh and Detox, and then it appeared again, I think, on a, a short-run EP that we had called Nowhere to Go, and which also featured another song that's on the album, Nowhere to Go. And these, and these songs have just been, like, run through the ringer so many times at this point that... It's it's an interesting combination of both the growth of the band musically and you know playing ability wise with a lot of the raw energy of the stuff that we first wrote when we were you know super young and hungry coming out there and just trying to you know make as much noise as we could. Mm-hmm. I think that that creates a really interesting sound on the album, at least for us. And I like bands that uh, do their own thing. They don't follow suit. They don't let management tell them how to, to sound. You know what I'm saying? And yeah. Yeah, and I, I hope you guys hear that uh, in our stuff, because that really was what we were all about. We decided that we were going to come out and we were going to play music that we wanted to hear, not exactly. you know what specific labels were telling us, hey, if you, if you change your sound to this to that, you know, well, let's talk a deal. Yeah. And it just, you know, it, it wasn't worth it to us to do that. I think, you know, uh, there's plenty of other jobs that you can, you know, sell your soul for and, and go out and make a lot more money than the music industry these days, you know? And if you're gonna if you're going to do something that you really care about, this is the type of music we wanted to hear. And, and frankly, it's, it's, it's the type of music that it sounds like a lot of people wanted to hear. Everybody's, you know, asking, hey, how come bands don't sound like they used to? Or, you know, what's going on with, mm-hmm. with all this kind of Gennaro, you know, trapped meets train meets Nickelback type of sound. And good for them for making money off of it. But if I can't tell the difference between, you know, eight of those bands. You know, it, it's just not something that, that I want to sit down and listen to or any of the guys in this band want to play. So... You know, we went out and we're like, hey, you know, this is back during when everyone was waiting for Chinese democracy to come out and everybody was, uh, yeah. you know, like, oh, man, you know, here comes Velvet Revolver. But, like, Velvet Revolver sounded a lot more like Stone Temple Pilots, which was cool, but it wasn't, you know, you were hoping that it was going to be like, oh, hey, here comes Appetite with Scott Weiland, you know? Something and, totally off the wall that we never heard before. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And and honestly, I love the Velvet Revolver album. I did they're, too. they're fantastic, but they're not, they're not what I was looking for. 
mm-hmm. you know? And eventually, uh, I think we just got to the point where we were like, hey, you know, we can play this stuff. We want to play stuff that sounds like, you know, badass, you know, hard blues-driven rock and roll. And stuff that has sections to it that doesn't just have, you know, a verse and a chorus and call it a day. You know, like a lot of stuff to, that the labels make people do today. It's just so freaking formulaic. And, um, you know, it's interesting. I, I had a, actually a recent um, review, which I was kind of excited to get because it was somebody that, you know, was more critical about the album. And he was saying, oh, you know, they sound like these guys on this song and these guys on this song and these guys on this song. And like all these, you know, different comparisons, which uh, are absolutely accurate because we had borrowed from everybody that we thought was cool and everybody we could think of. But, uh, uh, but to me, like, that's, that's kind of what, you know, I like about uh, a lot of the best bands. I go through track by track on Appetite. I can tell you where 90% of those songs came from. Mm-hmm. Everything from Elvis to, you know, Hanoi Rocks, like up and down the, the, the gamut there. But, um, you know, I think that that's what's so cool about music itself and, you know, rock and roll specifically is that you hear, you know, uh, your influences so much in, in the sounds. Because there's nothing, let's be straight here, John. No, <laughs> nobody's doing anything in rock and roll that hasn't at least been attempted before. It's not like it's a, you know, crazy Skrillex type of, you know, oh, now these sound like Transformers having sex kind of music. You know, this is, <laughs> this is something that, you know, <laughs> people have kind of heard before. But what I think is, is cool is when you bring your own thing to it and you tell your own stories with it, you know. Yeah. And guys like a uh, big influence of mine, Bruce Springsteen, you know, you may not hear the the kind of like, you know, working man blue collar sound as much in us, but his approach to writing and the clash was the same way with this, where it was very, tried to do very personal albums and, and tell like real stories about, you know, experiences they went through. And even if the music is a flavor that you might have heard before, I think the stories are what separates it and what makes it real and genuine. Yeah. And, 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 you know, we don't need a little, n- another star scream junior running around. <laughs> exactly. You know, it's, it's just, uh, I think at this point, you know, we're very happy with the subject matter of the songs. And I think, you know, and musically we've got, uh, I'll never be happy with, with where we are. I don't think any of us ever will. We're, we're all, a lot of us in the band are ex-athletes. We're used to, you know, coaches chirping at our ear left and right about, you know, here's what you need to improve on, not so much what you're doing well. But I like that, you know, I think... Yeah. You know, you, you hear a lot of people say, oh, this is amazing, this is great. And you've got nowhere to go with that. You know, if somebody says, hey, you know, this, this writing could improve here, this could be hookier, this could be stronger. That's, you know, that's the stuff that makes you better. And so, um, yeah, the re- getting back to the review I was talking about, you know, he called us out on a couple things that I totally agree with. And uh, it's nice hearing that stuff. And it's nice hearing people that listen deeply enough to the album to say, hey, listen, you know, this is cool here, but like, you know, here's where you guys have a weakness. And, Maybe album two, you guys fix that. So, Sean, what was it for you that gave you that bite to say, I want to be a musician? What was that poison? Well, I think it was frustration overall with, you know, what I was hearing on the radio. And, and I've always, um, you know, ever since I was a little kid and was jumping up and down on the couch to uh, Van Halen's jump, <laughs> you know, it's uh, I've always really liked music and I always felt like it was kind of... It, uh, maybe like a touchstone or a um, kind of a soundtrack to where you are when you're hearing that stuff. And, mm. and I go back to all kinds of uh, different bands that were around either, you know, when I was in high school and I remember going to parties and listening to them and that kind of stuff. And it, it set you in that element. And, uh, you know, I think when I wasn't hearing anything else that I wanted to listen to anymore on the radio, it, it was a real like galvanizing point for me where it was just like, you know, come on guys, it can't be this hard to get out there and, and, and do something. And, you know, I'd, I'd studied so much music just by virtue of listening to it, like I'm sure you, you have at this point. Like, <laughs> most, of the, most of the people with uh, these radio shows here, we've we listened to so many, so many different bands that you could be a professor in it. Oh, yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And it, and it just becomes it's something where, you know, if you have the opportunity to go out and, you know, create some of those stories and create some of that, you know, um, uh, that work that, that people get attached to, it's, it's an amazing opportunity. And, and luckily we were at a point in our lives where we were still young enough to do it. And we went out there and we, you know, thrust ourselves into the same situation that our heroes were in, you know, whether it was Aerosmith or, you know, Guns or, or Hanoi or um, any of those bands that kind of all piled into a small place together and did nothing but write and party and, and, and work their way up. You know, and then I think that that was that was something that was really appealing to us. I'm glad that you still recognize Guns N' Roses because, you know, Guns N' Roses still to this day, to me, is one of the, the biggest iconic bands ever. I mean, two of my favorite bands, one of them is Guns N' Roses and the next one is Metallica. 
You know, yeah. those are my two most biggest bands that, that uh, I care a lot about for. And that's cool that you guys still incorporate that. So kudos to you, man. Well, thanks. And it really is uh, to us, you know, when, when we start talking about, you know, what is, what is Crash Me Next sound like? Describe yourselves or when people start describing us as, you know, oh, you sound like Aerosmith, you sound like Guns N' Roses, you sound like this and that. Mm-hmm. And it's fine because most of the bands that compare us to don't sound like they used to anymore. So, right. <laughs> <laughs> so there's really just such a huge void for, you know, this style of music out there. Other mm-hmm. than, I will say, you know, some of the new stuff that Stones put out, really, really cool. Uh, Tom Kiefer from Cinderella just put out a, an amazing track. He sure did. Called Cold Day in Hell. Yep. Um, and it's it's got this great, you know, gritty, bluesy, uh, uh, almost Stones type of vibe to it. That whole and album does. Like, give him a quick plug because his publicist and our publicist are the same company. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Doug. Doug's a great guy. I mean, my God, he's he's helped me out through some interviews, and you guys do have a good PR guy. That, that's for sure. And uh, oh yeah, you know, and you was talking about Tom Kiefer. That whole album he's got out that is just phenomenal. I mean, from top to bottom. And plus, th- these are songs, man, that that's been laying around for a while that he's just put up. So yeah, this you know that. We just got more in store, so that's, that's all I gotta say. <laughs> yeah, there there is this music out here. It's, it's just you know, right now, for whatever reason, uh, the industry has kind of gotten itself in a rut where it's it it's stuck saying you know we don't have any big bands to push any iconic bands. And it's like, well, guys, been signing people that you know play generic music and look like accountants for so long mm-hmm. that you know nobody believes what's coming out of them anymore. I don't want to hear a guy that comes on stage with a crew cut and a freaking you know I don't know the some sort of like button down shirt pinned up to his neck telling me how to you know a party and rock and roll or all the crazy drugs and sex that he's been having it's like <laughs> you no know, you haven't yeah. you've got a day job what the hell are you talking about like you know I, and i think the kids today and this is something that i saw uh, i'm sure at some point we'll talk about the uh the tour that we just got off of but there was um with the pretty reckless there were a lot of young young teenage girls there that surprised the hell out of me with you know, their taste in music, the bands that they were into, everybody from Zeppelin to uh, Janis Joplin, which you know, I never would have thought something is like not poppy as Janis Joplin would appeal to, to that level, you know, that age group. And it was really cool. We had a bunch of girls that, that were coming in dressed like, you know, dressed like Taylor Monson, but essentially dressed like Stevie Nicks, right. you know, and, and there is that, there is that group out there that seems to be slowly turning. You know, you've got the dads that grew up in the 70s and 80s that are introducing their kids to, to this type of music and shoot, I've never had I, I never would have imagined that I'd have fathers coming up to me and the other you know degenerates in this band asking me to get a picture taken with their daughters I always wow. thought that would be about the opposite of what I'd eat father would like with their daughter yeah really it's like you stay away from my daughter <laughs> yeah exactly you know I, I mean shoot I'd be telling if I had a daughter I'd be telling her to stay the heck away from us but <laughs> well let's jump right into that tour because that was a pretty big tour for you guys how was that you know going from from the small towns that you're used to playing to being out with a pretty reckless like that, and plus seeing the crowd as majority of, of girls and things. So how was that for you guys? Well, it was it was the exact opposite of the Seven Dust tour that we were on right before that. The Seven Dust tour was a lot more, um, you know, the next age group up of guys, like the late 20s, early 30s for the most part, you know, and a very hard rock crowd. And that was really cool for us because, you know, I feel like that's one of the toughest crowds to impress. Mm-hmm. They're very set in their ways. They're going out to see a band that's been out here for skitty a gajillion years. And uh, they came there because I knew every song Seven Dust played. And now you come out and our radio hadn't even started. So it's, you know, it, our first impression is, is, is that night for them. And that was an interesting challenge. And those were slightly smaller clubs. And then to jump right from that into this pretty reckless tour with Adelie this way, the, the fan base skewed immediately. All of a sudden, there were all these young girls there. We actually, we, we dubbed it the Jailbait Tour 2014, um, <laughs> <laughs> which was wild. But, uh, you know, and you had Taylor's fans that were generally the youngest girls. Then you had the Pretty Reckless fans that just really liked the music. And their music is phenomenal. I don't oh, know yeah. if you've gotten a chance to listen yeah, to much is, of it. But it, it's it just, really is. It's, it's so nice to hear, number one, that style of music. But number two, just a young uh, woman, you know, getting up on stage and just absolutely owning it. And... Taylor, uh, you know, that she's gotten uh, all these mixed reviews on, you know, is she for real? Is she not for real? And I'll tell you what, those songs are for real. You mm-hmm. know, she gets up on stage and she commands that audience. She's got this great, you know, uh, Joan Jett delivered through Stevie Nicks, you know, type of uh, presence forward. on stage. Yeah, and, and she just, it's, it's, 
it's a really cool act to see. And it's great because you see the, the girls coming in there. And, and for me, you know, as, as a front man, it's easy for a guy to be a front man. You go up there and you talk about, you know, all the, the, the girls and the parties and all that stuff. And nobody, everybody thinks you're cool, you know? Yeah. The girl gets up there and does that, and it's so easy to marginalize her as, you know, oh, she's a party girl or a bimbo or a slut or whatever. Yeah. And uh, for a girl to be able to get on stage and, and command that sex, drugs, rock and roll vibe and not get thrown into that, you know, category where she's just dismissed as, you know, a, I don't know, you, you name their girl, a Paris Hilton type of, type of person. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a real, it's a real accomplishment, and, and it's awesome to see those young girls and look at her and be like, hey, you know, I can do this. Mm-hmm. Instead of, I could date the lead singer of a band, it's like, I could be the lead singer of a band. And that, that's my biggest takeaway, honestly, <laughs> from this, this whole tour. But uh, it was amazing seeing the audience, too, uh, being able to impress girls that I would have thought would have been much more geared towards pop music and that stuff. Having them, you know, jump on board with this band, both with the look, the presence, and, and the songs. Um, that, that was uh, very validating for us, I think. Well, here's something then, cool, too. That, that oh, yeah. just, here's something cool that you just hit on, you know. You got all these girl lead singers, and I mean, it seems like they're coming out in, in waves now. And I mean, they're not just mm-hmm. coming out in waves and just tiptoeing around. I mean, they're kicking ass. You got Jill Janice from Huntress. You've got uh, mm-hmm. the, the the new uh, lady from uh, Arch Enemy. God, she yep. can wail. She can wail on the vocals. And you've Hail got... Storm. Uh, do what? Hailstorm's killing it, too. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it really is. And, but you know, you got the throwback, Slita Ford. She can still do it. I mean... Mm-hmm. You know, I think this is cool because um, I saw the Pretty Reckless at Rock on the Range, and um, she they they did a hell of a job, man, hell of a job. Yeah, they're they're a strong, strong act, and and I think you know the more you start seeing girls be able to you know break out of that, you know I'm gonna throw my body up on Instagram for attention and actually mm-hmm. you know say hey I'm gonna do something worthwhile to get attention. It's it's a whole other animal, and it it's it made me really proud of just everything that that Taylor was doing and obviously the struggle that it takes to get out of being, you know, an actress and, and not taken seriously as an artist, you know, in, in the musical sense, and then to blow the doors off everybody and all of a sudden reinvent yourself. Exactly. So let's get back to the, uh, Chris, the, the crash midnight here. I want to know how you guys do this because is it just you primarily writing the music or does everybody uh, in a band contribute to writing the songs and how do y'all work that out? Really what it takes is both myself and Bo and, and Alex, all three of us, to create a Crash Midnight song. Anything that I bring to the table is usually, you know, there might be a, a ballpark idea of a riff thrown in there, but generally it's, you know, here's a chorus and ballpark progression, and, and here we go, and this is kind of the idea of what I was thinking. And then Bo takes it and rips apart any of the lyrics that he deems are, are not cool enough or are too cheesy, and uh, then rearranges the song to have more of a groove to it, and Alex does the same thing. So it, it always gets mangled, raped, and then switched around until it sounds like us. Mm-hmm. But I think that's the formula, is that no one of us can really start to finish write a Crash Midnight song. And, <laughs> you know, for a, lot of, for a lot of our heroes, I think that's kind of, you know, how it was. Like, you, you heard, like, when Joe Perry left Aerosmith, it didn't sound the same, yeah. you know? And when you, have, uh, when you have guys, I mean, shoot, I like Chinese democracy, but it doesn't sound like anything like it used to when Izzy was involved, you no, know? No, it don't. So it, I think it, it does take that, like, you know, that, that right mix of personalities and influences to, to get a sound, and, and we're real proud of just a chaotic uh, formula that, that this takes to, to come up with our sound. And uh, also, too, do you guys prefer the club atmosphere, or do you mind the festivals? Well, I mean, uh, festivals are great just because it's, you know, generally open air, you're you're out there, and it's, you know, huge audiences, and I I love being able to, to go out there and get a whole sea of people going, you know, and I think, honestly, that's a, that's an easier job for a front man than it is for clubs. you got to work a lot harder for clubs, because the smaller the size gets, the less the crowd mentality kicks kicks in and you got to make sure that you've engaged every single person in a hundred to 200 seater, whereas you can kind of throw your hands in the air and, you know, the masses follow when it's a, when it's a bigger festival, but not that I'm knocking having that, uh, <laughs> not bad to have an easy ride either. Right, right. But, um, you know, the clubs like, Oh, we played first Avenue in, in Minneapolis on, on this tour. And it was a tough crowd. It was, uh, I think it was, you know, early in the week night. And, you know, we were so excited to be, you know, where they filmed purple rain that we were on a high to begin with. Um, we got on stage and it was one where I don't think we'd done a ton of press ahead of time or anything. And we, um, you know, we were, we were coming in real cold to that audience and it, it took everything we could do. I and mean, we tore shirts off, threw them out in the audience. We did, you know, by the end of the set, it was going. 
But uh, I think, you know, those smaller clubs really make you work for it. And in the end, I think that makes you a better artist, too. The, you know, the harder you have to work for something, the, the more stops you have to pull out, the better your performance is going to get night after night. Yeah, the more you appreciate it, too. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, mm-hmm. you, you work hard to, to get that audience on board with you, then I think that's, that's a big, big changing point um, yeah. for you as an artist. And I, I saw, honestly, after that show in Minneapolis, our shows, even in the bigger places, got ramped up higher and higher just from ideas that we came up with on the fly to, to try to engage that audience. So what can fans expect that haven't got to see you guys yet at a show from you? Well, they can expect a different show every night. <laughs> that. That's that's one thing that we've always uh, really prided ourselves on. And for this run, because it was such a, um, uh, we weren't expecting to go out on this tour. This tour kind of fell in our lap about two weeks before it was leaving. So we didn't have a lot of time to, to get all the, the songs in the album up and running the way we wanted to for the tour. So we stuck with the same set every night. But generally, we'll have a, an opening song, a closing song, and maybe one or two songs that you know come before or after another one. But the rest of it is on the fly. If, if we notice that you know the crowd's lagging a little, we'll play a more up-tempo song like "Long as It's Free" or "City Girl." And if it's you know a crowd of of the more uh, you know younger girls, or if it's more of let's say a kid rock type of crowd, like Southern rock type of thing, you know we'll pull out songs that maybe work a little bit better for that. But we try to try to kind of do the. Uh, What's, what was it, the Peyton Manning thing? We call it at the line of scrimmage, you know. <laughs> Get up there and, and whatever we're feeling, we go with, and we'll change covers, we'll change anything mid set just to um, to try to get the best sound we can. And uh, you know, and, and as far as the the show itself, there's absolutely nothing scripted in the show. <laughs> Alex fell down in the uh, photo pit in the middle of um, what was it like the third song in in, in uh, Times Square when we were playing Best Buy. <laughs> yeah, the uh, the security guys are like trying to lift him up and put him back on stage, and almost a spinal tap moment or something. And you know, he's still playing through the crowd, going wild. The girls got on uh, got on uh, their their boys' shoulders and stuff, and now the security's like trying to help him on stage and yell at them to get off each other's shoulders because you're not allowed to do that in New York or something. It's, wow. I don't know. It's 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 a wild time, and we try to just bring you know our parties out to the clubs when we play them. That's you know, and awesome. People kind of party along with us. Uh, the first time you heard the fans singing along to the music that you guys have written, what type of confirmation was that for you? Well, it, this wasn't the first time we heard him sing this stuff back to us, but uh, this was probably one of the the best times we heard it. And it was right when we left on this tour in Boston. It was it's the first show we played with the Pretty Reckless was at the House of Blues Boston, which used to be called Avalon, which we did play one time way back in the day on some uh, ridiculous I don't know, it was like a fashion show thing. I don't know what the hell we got ourselves into back then, but um, yeah, it, was, it was ridiculous. A lot of rich kids with too much money throwing around. Yeah, they can get but, what um, they want to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Everybody knows how that goes in this industry. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, so we uh, we finally got to play this song. This is the first time as a, as a full band we had even played this song live. Because uh, Welcome to Boston used to be called uh, Nothing to Lose. And we we weren't even going to put it on the album just because it kind of felt like, eh, you know, I'm, there's a million bands with a song called Nothing to Lose. And it just kind of felt trite. And it was also a little bit, uh, it was even more metally than it is right now. And we really don't like to accentuate that style, uh, you know, in, in our music. We try to really go back to a little bit more of a 70s thing when we can. And naturally, it ends up pulling a little bit more towards the appetite era Guns N' Roses. So we're, we're okay if it's a little bit less metally Guns N' Roses, I guess. <laughs> at the end of the day so it wasn't going to even make the album and then there were um there were a bunch of friends that we have uh just in you know in the nfl and in, in um in uh, the patriots camp and the boston college camp and stuff like that and they were asking if they could use one of our songs and uh, a lot of people have been using nothing to lose on a, a previous ep that we put out so we're like well you know nothing to lose is actually written about the kind of you know chip on your shoulder and don't mess with me and I'll spit on you as soon as look at you type of mentality that, that Boston has. It's a, it's a, it's a, that type of city, you know? <laughs> and, uh, at that point we're just like, why are we, you know, that we don't even like the title anyway. Why are we beating around the bush with this? This is, we're coming out of Boston. We might as well have an anthem. And, uh, we changed it around and all of a sudden the Patriots picked it up. I was, you know, a month or two later, I was singing the national anthem before a uh, Patriots Browns game and all this stuff. So this, this song has just started picking up momentum here in Boston and to hear the fans in the audience, there was a packed house of blues that night singing our song back to us. I think was probably the most you've arrived type of moment that, that we've had here as a band. Didn't ES- uh, Sean, didn't ESPN pick that song up too and, and run it for a little bit? If I'm not mistaken, you 
ESPN hasn't. We've actually had some talks with, with them, oh, okay. and Doug is kind of in the middle of that right now. We're trying to get them to do some stuff. We gave it to the Bruins a couple seasons ago, and purportedly they, they played it at some um, games, but I don't have any confirmation of that. I know the Patriots have played it in every single home game because I was there when they were doing it. And Boston College football and Boston College uh, basketball actually have been, have been doing it. So big thanks to all of them. So what does Crash Midnight bring to the table for music, in your opinion? You know, I think we, we bring something that has been completely lacking uh, <laughs> for a long time here in, in our genre, and that's there's a lot of bands that sound like other bands here, but I think we actually decided to choose to sound like bands that were good. And I, I mean that in every conceited way possible, because it's just, <laughs> you know, we, we got so tired of everybody saying, hey, you know, let's Nickelback do it on the charts, let's go sound like them. Well, yeah. you know, Nickelback's doing Nickelback, you know, they're, they're, let them do it. And there's nobody out there right now, really, you know, especially like in the new bands that, that are sounding like old school rock and roll, like the real roots of this or the stuff that, that gave birth to all of this. And everybody's just kind of, you know, meandering around in this, this weird rut. And I, I don't know why. It's, it's partially the labels are, you know, um, not paying for you unless you do that. But, you know, you, you would think somebody would take the temperature of the situation and, and say, hey, you know, there is a huge rock crowd that is going out to see all the nostalgia acts out there mm -hmm. and they can only tour with oxygen tanks and defibrillators for so long before they can't go out anymore <laughs> and somebody better pay for something and i don't know if i don't know if we're gonna be the uh the guys that that change the course of stuff you know i, I think our albums are good and i'm proud of it but you know we've got miles to go before we're anywhere near that but at least we're trying and uh, i hope that that um <clears throat> I hope that if we can have some success with that, that that, you know, get some other bands out there who might be better than us <laughs> to come out and, and start making some more music like this because it's yeah. just not out there right now. No, and, and you're right, like you said earlier. The, you, you, nowadays, you hear one band, you've heard eight or ten of them already on radio. It's the same. I can't thing. distinguish between some of the, uh, yeah. the new singles coming out. It's just, you know, a, a mid to low range male vocal, you know, very predictable you know, verse into chorus and call it a day. There's no guitar involved in any of it. Yeah. It's all drop E. There's and, no more, uh, you know, th there's no more of the vintage guitar solos that you used to hear, you know? Yeah. That stuff was cool. Like, yeah, I, was. I don't know why, <laughs> I don't know why you get rid of something that was so great. And yeah. a lot of people are like that too. I mean, you look at our, uh, I, I am so proud of everything that's happened on our social media stuff, especially Twitter. And, um, you know, you talk about the validating stuff and how good it felt to hear, somebody sing your song back to you. Well, it, it feels really good to hear people with the same um, reaction over and over, both in live shows and, and on Twitter. I'm just saying, finally, somebody that sounds like you guys. Like, I've, mm -hmm. I've been waiting for something to sound like this for so long. And I just keep forwarding that to our record label over and over again. I'm like, here, send this to all the other record labels, too. I don't care. I'd love to have competition. Yeah. Like, <laughs> if we had 40 bands that had, you know, a cool rock and roll sound, I would be so psyched. Go ahead. Steal, steal our audience. Go for it. Like, Let's just get this stuff back on the airwaves so yeah. you know the, so the kids can hear it. <clears throat> so what's it mean to you guys, Sean, when a fan comes up prior or after the show or you receive an email that says, Hey, look, your guys has your guys' music has inspired me, it's pulled me out of a dark hole, um, inspiration. What's that mean to you guys? Well, I think usually our music uh, is part of the reason you end up in a dark hole or on the ditch and on the side of the road. But um, it's, it certainly is, like, that's that's the whole reason we're doing this stuff. Yeah. I mean, we we ended up, yes, like, why I got into music, and it's probably because we'd be incarcerated if I, if we did. You know, we've never really been great with the whole authority thing, as you could probably tell. <laughs> <laughs> Telling, uh, you know, other labels that want to give you a bunch of money to go screw because we, you know, we're going to play this sound. If we're not playing this sound, we'll go do something else. Right. And I think that the, um, I, I think that hearing, you know, fans come to you and say, hey, listen, you know, we came here to say, to see this band, and we just got introduced to you guys, and I want everything that you guys have. Give me a CD, give me a t-shirt, give me a bottle opener, give me everything, you know. That's, that means a ton to us, because number one, we can't do this without them. The only reason that we're able to go on the road is because they're paying for us to be there. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's that's a big, big point. And I think a, a lot of bands lose sight of that, especially as they get bigger. And we really tried to make it a point to, you know, while we're proud of our sound and, and all that stuff, uh, humbly, we're we're nothing if we don't have people that want to hear us. Exactly. You know, exactly. It's all about the yeah. fans, man. It really is, and I don't understand how people lose sight of that. I know you can. Uh, we run into the occasional oddball that's you know a little little out there. Or, 
or obsessive in a strange way and stuff. But you know what? That's a very small price to pay to be able to do this for yeah, a living. Exactly. Ladies and gentlemen, it looks like their tour ended on November the 8th. So what do you have planned coming up here shortly or after the first of the year? What you got any plans so far? Well, we were going to do a big uh, CD release party here for the release on, um, on the 18th, but we had just gotten back, and actually Alex, our lead guitarist, is from Columbus, Ohio, and he had to get back out there and just seemed stupid to fly him right back out you know, four or five days later to come do a release party, especially since we're not even going to start radio until the new year. So for us, we're like, all right, you know what, let's make this a huge bash. Let's try to do something that's not completely half-assed for once in our career. And we're going to do a big release party in, in January. We've got um, major radio underway in January. And then we've also got a, a, a handful of different things that we're trying to get involved with for touring. And, and it's it's a kind of a toss-up between it's going to be either a radio-based tour or we might go right back out on the road with something around the same level as what we were just out on. And it all kind of depends on where booking agents and, and stuff falls here. But uh, we might do a combination of the two. We might go out on one of those and then on the off days do the radio shows. Awesome. So 2015 is going to be a big one, a real, real busy one for us. Awesome. Sean, I want to thank you for taking time out to do this interview. You have total support here from Bod's Mayhem Hour and Uber City Radio. Before I let you go, how can people stay in touch with you guys? Buy your merch. Everybody get some merch. Get the new album, Lost in the City. How can he do that? Hell yeah. Well, the, the biggest thing for getting uh, getting our stuff is to get the album because the album is going to, the album sales are going to dictate, you know, how many more physical copies they get, and that's going to dictate how fast we're out on the road to see you guys. Mm-hmm. So uh, you can get it at, online at Best Buy, online at Target, online at Barnes & Nobles, uh, and then you can also pick it up if you want to, that's for the physical copy, if you want to download, um, you can get it on Amazon and iTunes, and then they kind of spread that out to all the gajillion other sites that you can download the album off of. Mm-hmm. Please get the album, it's it's. 10 bucks or, or so, something like that. If you guys find us on the road, we'll sign it. You know, this is, uh, this is the way that our fans can show all these labels that have, have said, go sound like Nickelback to us, that we don't need to go sound like that. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I agree. We're on Facebook and we're on Twitter. Please connect with us on that. Facebook band page is just facebook.com slash crash midnight. And there's a link to all of our personal Facebook pages, which we leave open for everybody. You guys can contact us. We love talking to people. Sean, before I let you go, you care to do a promo for my show? Absolutely. This is Sean Soho from Crash Midnight, and you're listening to Bob's Mayhem Hour. Everybody stick around. we got some music coming up for you girls and guys out there listening to the show this evening. And once again, you only hear these interviews right here on Bob's Mayhem Hour and Uber City Radio. Thanks, Sean. Thank you, John. I'll talk to you soon.